Jamaica is a country that's heavily dependent on food imports. Um, Jamaica is actually heavily dependent on imports of everything. <laughs> for, for most of its history as an independent country, it's imported more than it's exported. Uh, but food in particular, um, the, the biggest element on the um, import bill is oil, of course, as it is in many developing countries. Um, but aside from oil, imported food <coughs> accounts for about 20 to 25 percent of Jamaica's imports, putting us in a difficult position. Um, it consumes scarce foreign exchange, especially scarce when you import more than you export. Um, and also, as um, Matthias was talking about, um, creates problems when we get to a point where food prices are high, as they have been recently. Um, a lot of the food that we import is food that could, we could be producing ourselves, could be growing ourselves. Things like potatoes and tomatoes. Um, and so the Jamaican government under these conditions has launched several campaigns recently trying to convince people to, um, as one of the slogan goes, eat what we grow and grow what we eat in order to reduce the dependence on food imports. And a lot of the discourse in Jamaica about food imports is, is of that nature, um, speaking about agricultural crops that are directly imported in that form. Um, the main point, I guess, that I want to make today is that if you look at the way that Jamaica is integrated into the global food system, the problem is more complex than that. It's more complex than just imported potatoes or tomatoes. Um, in order to do that kind of analysis, I use food regime theory, um, which looks at the implicit and explicit rules that structure the global food system. Um, and I don't really have time to explain it any more than that, but um, some of you, I hope, are familiar with the work of Harriet Friedman and Philip McMichael, who have done um, a lot of work in that area. Um, a problem with food regime theory, though, is that it focuses mainly on developing countries as producers. And as, as someone, I don't remember who it was now, said in the discussion yesterday, we tend to think as if all the consumers are located in the north. And so the, the um, analysis of food consumption focuses on northern consumers. But there are a lot of consumers, obviously, in the developing world as well. Um, there is one aspect of food regime theory that does talk about food consumption in the South. And that is around the issue of PL 480, Public Law 480 in the US, which was passed in the 1950s in order to deal with grain surpluses in the US that had built up because of the government's price support program to support farmers. Um, they bought grains in order to maintain prices, and they wound up holding huge stocks of grain. And in the 1950s, then, the U.S. hit on this idea of using the surplus grain as food aid to the developing world for uh, a number of different reasons. Um, but one that was explicitly stated in the legislation was um, to create a taste in developing countries for the grains that the US was producing in surplus. Um, give them the grains now or sell it to them at reduced prices, get them hooked on it, and then we'll have consumers in the long run. Sort of the, the stereotypical strategy of the drug pusher. <laughs> um, 
And so my analysis sort of builds on that aspect of food regime theory. So the first commodity I look at um, is wheat, which was the main commodity that was involved in this PL 480 food aid. Um, the food regime theory analyzes um, the trade in wheat partly in terms of changing the diets of third world people um, who didn't normally eat wheat in order to get them to eat more wheat. Um, the situation in Jamaica is a little bit different because of British colonialism. Jamaicans had learned to eat bread, the main form that wheat is consumed in, uh, long before the 1950s. Uh, Jamaica did receive wheat under the PL 480 program, um, also known as Food for Peace. Um, and so when you look at wheat imports, you see that um, in the 1950s, we were already importing wheat. Um, the interesting change that happens in the way we import wheat um, is that up to 1968, we imported wheat flour, that is a processed form of wheat. In 1968, the Jamaican flour mills uh, opened and began processing flour locally. And so you see between 1968 and 1973 a shift from importing flour to importing whole wheat, which was then milled into flour in Jamaica. Um, sounds like sort of a partial success story in that at least we were moving one step back along the commodity chain, taking some of the processing of the product um, inside the country and, and adding value inside the country. Small contribution possibly to uh, uh, the development of the country. Uh, then if you look at the ownership of Jamaica flour mills, it started out as a 50-50 uh, joint venture, Pillsbury, owned 50% and local capitalists owned 50%. Um, in 1992, the local capitalists actually bought out Pillsbury and for a brief period, Jamaica Flour Mills was Jamaican owned. And then in 1997, it was taken over by Archer Daniels Midland, one of the agribusiness giants. Um, so we've got in-country processing of wheat, but it's controlled by uh, agribusiness TNCs. Um, food regime theory also focuses on other leading sectors of the food economy, which sort of lead and exemplify the uh, way that food systems are being restructured or have been restructured by these agribusiness corporations. Um, and another one of those main leading sectors is beef. And so I've taken a look at beef as well. Um, what you see if you look at beef imports is that um, through the 1960s and uh, early 1970s, beef imports were also increasing into Jamaica. Um, part of that had to do with the tourist industry when um, tourists from the developed countries came to Jamaica, they expected first world quality steaks in their restaurants. Um, and in order to get those, uh, we had to import them. But during the 1960s, we also started, uh, well, not started, but increased uh, local production of beef. Through the same kind of intensive feedlot system that was pioneered in the US, and of course the problem with that system is that it depends on imported feed. Um, Jamaica doesn't grow uh, corn or soy, grow a little bit of corn but not much. 
um, which are the main constituents of animal feeds. And so in order to increase beef production, then we needed to import um, animal feed. Um, in, uh-oh, <laughs> okay. Um, in 1979, this is in the midst of the economic crisis in one of the many economic crises in Jamaica, um, the state trading corporation that controlled the imports of many basic commodities decided to stop importing beef because there just wasn't enough foreign exchange and they had to cut something. So beef was one of the things that got cut. That stimulated local production to increase somewhat, um, but not nearly enough to take up the amount of imports that uh, had been cut off. Um, part of the reason for that was that consumers uh, during the 1970s were switching to chicken as the most popular source of meat. Um, there is some local production of chicken as well, which also depends on imported feeds. Um, and since I'm running out of time, I don't have the time <laughs> to, to tell the whole story of the meat production in Jamaica. Um, and um, the story of feed is somewhat similar, I think, to the story of wheat, although I haven't gone into it in uh, enough detail yet. We've gone from importing prepared feeds to importing the ingredients for feed, which are then processed into the, the animal feed locally. Um, okay, uh, that's, that's all I have to give you, all the time I have to give you about the empirical details of food imports into Jamaica. Um, so let me turn to some conclusions now. Um, what I see happening over time as I look at this is that as the food system evolves, transnational corporations continue to develop new food products in order to maintain their profits. And as they develop these new products, production increases, and uh, some of that production gets dumped on the third world, often at subsidized prices, um, and often displacing some local production, although um, in some of the examples I've, I've given you today, wheat and soy and corn, we don't grow any, and so uh, that doesn't displace local production. Um, and the process of, of um, food dependence, food import dependence then is cumulative because food importing, net food importing countries keep importing these new leading products from the leading sectors of the agribusiness um, economy um, and Im new import dependencies are added on top of the old ones. Um, but in the changes that happened in the 60s and 70s, uh, we don't see very many fundamental changes in the Jamaican diet. We're importing things that we ate already, for the most part. Um, things change in, beginning in the 1990s, and I didn't have time to give you any empirical details of this story, but um, what happens beginning in the 1990s is First of all, trade liberalization. Um, everyone remembers the 1970s, Michael Manley as the great democratic socialist. Um, what fewer people remember um, is that Michael Manley came back in the 1990s um, as a born again neoliberal and he was the one who was really responsible for <laughs> finishing the liberalization of uh, the trade regime in Jamaica. Um, and that opened Jamaica to a flood of processed food. Um, that is really where diets have begun to change in the 1990s and into the 2000s. 
people are eating more fast food, more processed food. Um, there's more food sold through supermarkets, uh, which is the, the retail counterpart of what Harriet Friedman calls durable food, food that has a long shelf life. In other words, processed food. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm out of time. Um, and once, once diets change, it becomes much more difficult to overcome import dependence because people become dependent on these new forms of import which may not necessarily be able to be produced locally and have to be um, gotten through imports. Uh, so I believe that um, what we need in Jamaica is some import substitution for food. Um, and I support the goals of the food sovereignty movement, which talk about um, returning food production to local control. Um, and I just want to mention quickly here, um, Ricardo um, made a very good point yesterday in the discussion that we are raising the price of carbon. However we go about doing that, that's going to be one of the ultimate outcomes of the process that we're going through. And that's going to change the economics of the food economy. It won't be so easy or cheap to ship all these intermediate food processed products around the world. And we're going to have to look at uh, more local production of food. And so uh, I'm actually, despite the general depressing nature of all of these presentations, I'm actually somewhat optimistic about um, returning more local food, more, more local control over the food system to developing countries. Thank you.